All right, everybody, this is going to be part two of this reaction types and a little bit about predicting products. And so you've seen this slide before. In the first video, I talked about those first three redox reactions. This is the video where I'm going to go ahead and talk about single replacement, and double replacement reactions. Single replacement is a redox reaction. We change the oxidation states. We are going to transfer electrons in that process. Interestingly, the double replacement reaction is not a redox, and it's the only non-redox that we're going to talk about right now. So let's go ahead and start with the single replacement reaction. What is it? One element, and that element is going to be in kind of its natural state, is going to replace, hence the wording, uh, some other element that's within a compound. For you to identify a single replacement reaction, what you should do is you should look over onto the reactant side. You should see an element, and then you should see specifically an ionic compound. To further kind of help you along, those individual elements that you see, they should probably either be a metal or a halogen gas. So that's fluorine or chlorine, bromine, and those are all gonna be a, a diatomic, right? So it's gonna be Cl2 or Br2 and so on. Then I have this little comment at the very bottom here that says something about check the activity series. And so we need to talk a little bit about what the activity series is. So here's the general form for this type of reaction. So I said you're going to have either your metal or your halogen here, and then you're going to have some sort of ionic compound sitting over here. That's going to be made up of some cation plus some anion in an appropriate empirical formula and one of those things is going to get kicked out for the ion version of whatever that element was and so you just have this swapping so notice a is displaced b and now a is partnered up over there with x and b is on its own redox reaction the electrons will have to transfer hands here now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this activity series the activity series rank orders the reactivity of different metals, so those would be the metals over here on the left, or you can get a rank order of the reactivity of different halogens. And so it just so happens that it's listed in a way so that the most reactive are up at the top, and what that means for us is that the most reactive thing will ultimately end up inside of the ionic compound. And hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense to you in just a little bit. I want to just point out that, again, these single replacement reactions are redox reactions. And so the redox reactions for uh, the halogens can be seen down here with the transfer of an electron. And then we also have over here the oxidation reactions, where you can see, again, the transfer of an electron. Now, those are important, but they're not the entire full picture for what's going on in order to get this ranking. And so that really it's nice to be able to look this up in a table or on the internet or wherever you can find the activity series. So again, remember the things that are higher up above are going to be more reactive. That means they're going to end up as the thing in the ionic compound. So let's look at some examples. So I have copper. There's the single element plus silver nitrate. There's the ionic compound. Now, this is very soluble, so I plop silver nitrate into some water, and it's now an aqueous solution. And if I were to, say, take a copper wire and dip it in there, then some of the copper itself is going to come off of the solid network, and it's going to become uh, copper ions in solution floating around. And some of the silver that was in solution, the green in this picture, is going to come and actually form a solid somewhere. Again, electrons are transferred in that process, but if you look at the end result, we had silver was initially part of the ionic compound. Now it is by itself, and the other thing, the copper, was in the ionic compound. So just to verify, look at the reactivity series, and you will see that copper is above silver. So copper is the more reactive. Copper will ultimately end up in the ionic compound. And so just verify that the end of the reaction is over here. Copper did indeed end up in the ionic compound location. So here's one where I'm going to show you with a halogen. So I've got my chlorine gas. 
That's the element. Now I have my ionic compound sitting here, and it happens to be with an iodide. And then I have a swapping that occurs. And so the iodide is going to now become its individual element in its natural state, so that's I2. And then we have our uh, NaCl, our table salt, that is now, the chlorine is now part of that ionic compound. So again, if we go check what's happening over here, we should see here were the two that we had. We had chlorine or chloride uh, in this case, and we had iodide. Those are the two options for what's going to be in the ionic compound. Chlorine is above, so chlorine is ultimately going to be the thing that is in that empirical formula. And if you look here, sure enough, there it is. One more example that we'll look at. So here's aluminum uh, plus iron three oxide is going to go to iron plus aluminum oxide. So this is a pretty famous reaction actually called the thermite reaction. This puts off tons of energy uh, so much. YouTube it, look it up. They have pictures of people using this reaction to weld railroad ties together, not the ties, the actual metal part of the railroad, because this gets so hot that this iron that pops out here, so initially it's in the uh, ionic compound, and then it will get replaced by the aluminum. And this releases so much energy that this actually will melt and you have molten iron. It's a pretty cool reaction. Anyways, just to verify, we see aluminum is higher up on the activity series than iron. So aluminum is going to end up as the thing that is in the compound the, with the empirical formula. And there it is over there. So <clears throat> just to point something out to you, what happens if you're put in a situation where you're looking at some reactants and the thing that is higher up on the activity series is already in the ionic compound. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's take iron and let's take gold. Gold is known to be very non-reactive or unreactive, whichever. So that I'm putting here in this reaction. So let's take this scenario where I have gold sitting there and then I have iron. It's the more reactive thing. It's already in the empirical formula. You can just go ahead and say no reaction will occur. So I've learned that by looking at the activity series. If I put these two things in, in contact, there's no way that there's going to be a reaction. This is already the globally, the more stable situation for this stuff. Okay, that was single replacement. Now let's look at double replacement. First time for any of these reactions that we've been talking about that there will not be any electron transfer. No changing of the uh, oxidation states of any of the things inside. So what does that mean for us? What it means is that you're going to have two ionic compounds. So each of those ionic compounds is going to have its own cation and its own anion. And there's going to be a very simple swapping. You will see this pattern. These are super easy to look at and identify. So look for two ionic compounds on the reactant side. There's going to be two on the right side. The cation anion combos will be switched and different on the different sides, though. And then I have this little note that this is important. Check for the solubility of all these different compounds, because usually something is going on there. Otherwise, it would not really be a reaction. OK, here's the general form. So as I said before, this would be the cation. This is the anion. Here's the other cation, the other anion. And what's going to happen is there's a switching. So where B was with Y, now B is with X. And the reverse is true over here as well. So pretty simple structure to them. Here is a nice little example for us. We have silver nitrate plus sodium chloride. I'm trying to just indicate to you uh, what compounds I'm using for each uh, ion in here so you can keep better track of it. So this is very soluble. Remember anything with nitrates are soluble. Uh, sodium chloride, table salt, very soluble. So you put it into solution and you have this mixing of these four different ions. And then two of those ions will find each other and they will bind to each other and they will form a solid and precipitate out. That happens to be the silver and the chloride in this particular situation. So this is why it is a reaction. If this was soluble, if silver chloride was soluble, it's not, but if it were, then you would just have a bunch of ions hanging out inside of a solution. And I would be hesitant to call that any sort of reaction. It would just be some salty water, okay? So 
Uh, it's really important to look at, you know, is something going to be a solid, a gas, a liquid, something like that, other than just plain old aqueous. Here's another example for you. So I've got lead to nitrate plus potassium sulfide. Okay, so we've got our lead is currently with the nitrate. Go over to the other side. My lead is no longer with the nitrate. It's now with the sulfide. Again, on all of these things, make sure that you're keeping track of what the charge of the ion is so that you can get the appropriate empirical formulas. In this particular case, lead sulfide is not soluble, so it would be the solid that would come out of solution as a precipitate. Everything else would be left in the solution and you know, if we assumed that you had equal quantities or the perfect matching of all the different ions, then the only thing that would be left in solution would be our potassium nitrate. There might be small amounts of this, but that's at a different level than what we want to talk about right now. Here's another <clears throat> double replacement reaction that is a specific type. So within the double replacement reaction, we can classify something called a neutralization reaction. I thought I would show that to you. So the neutralization reaction is when you take OHs and you match them up with Hs and you make yourself some water. So I take a base and I take an acid and they neutralize each other and I just get water out of it. So calcium hydroxide, here's the base part. Here's the hydrogen, that's the acid part. For the purposes of this little presentation, I'm just showing it as a nice little hydrogen. Some of you may know that it doesn't stick around. It's just a hydrogen when you're in solution. It goes to an H3O+. So they're kind of equivalent concepts for us right now. But what we're going to do is we're going to do our standard swapping. And then you end up with the neutralization. So the hydroxide and the hydrogen coming together. So it makes H2O. Now, that can be a little confusing to look at as far as the pattern is concerned. And so if you want, look at it like this. Here is your uh, HOH. There's your cation out front, H+, plus, and here's your OH-. minus. So that could help you understand the pattern of the double replacement. All right, that was it for this video as well. So we covered all five of these different reactions. Remember, four of the five were redox reactions where we have the electron transferred. And then our double replacement, where there was no electron transfer. So hopefully, uh, this was all pretty straightforward stuff. So hopefully that made sense. And if it did, let your computer know.